pronounced it pronounced. And we are live. Welcome to Life Action Roleplay with Cynthia Marie and Kai Norman and Ryan Omega joining us for today's topic of how to produce. Uh, oh, can't even say words. Whoop. How to produce. Let's start, start over. And we are live. Welcome to Life Action Roleplay with Cynthia Marie, Kai Norman, and Ryan Omega for today's topic of how to produce an RPG stream. Joining us today is, and let me have you introduce yourself, please. My name is Dom Zook, and uh, I am from Saving Throw Show, which is a streaming channel here on Twitch. All right. Thank you, Dom, for joining us. And next question, what are we drinking today? Let me start off with Sin. Um, I restarted drinking my kombucha. So this is a Synergy kombucha in ginger berry. No. Nice. I love that flavor. Kai, what are you drinking? Uh, I am getting back in touch with my, my Brit roots. And I have a feeling that the camera is going to reverse this. But um, I am drinking something called Iron Brew, uh, which is a very, very strange Scottish uh, soda that I recommend everyone try once because more than likely you won't like it. So you're never <laughs> going to try again. I, I hear a dare um, being oh, issued yeah. out to everybody. Dom, what are you drinking today? Um, I am drinking good old classic water. Hydrate. Hydrate yeah. or dihydrate. H2 a homie right here. <laughs> and I am drinking coffee. I don't know why coffee. It's seven. It's eight p.m. and I'm drinking coffee, <laughs> and uh, I just, It's weird. I just like the taste of it. That's one weird thing that's happened under the lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, behind the scenes, uh, I don't know if uh, people can hear him. Uh, are you able to introduce yourself as a disembodied voice? Yes. <laughs> all right true Thank greatness you. yes in a disembodied head or voice <laughs> so the reason why we're asking joda to to speak up is because while we're talking about how to produce a show it'd be very helpful that the person who is helping us produce this speaks up as well Hell yes yeah. all right shout outs Ooh, i'm a little echoey there uh shout outs so are there any shout outs that we like to give today? And let me start off with Sin. Um, my shout out is going to go to my friend Ellie over in Georgia. She runs Atlanta by night. Um, also, I'm going to be uh, working with her this weekend on Saturday in Gehenna, Game, uh, Gehenna Gaming. We're going to be doing uh, Vampire of the Dark Ages, but she's just such a wonderful and sweet human being. We were actually just talking about the fact that we've never met physically but like we have zoom chats all the time and like she's become like such an important part of my group um so much that she uh did a, a very generous donation to wildlife charity and she asked a bunch of a couple of us who what our favorite wild animals are or just animals in general mine's the flamingo so she um she what is it donated uh money to um in date like to flamingos and basically i have a flamingo in my name because of her <laughs> <laughs> so it was really sweet. So I just wanted to shout her out and say that she's awesome. And if you haven't seen ATL by night, you should, because it's really good. Nice. Kai, any shout outs for, from you today? You're on mute. I, I, I had things to say, but then I decided to silence myself. Um, so what I'm going to do a shout out for is actually, uh, I, I've been finding a lot of the things going on in real life in America really interesting. And I think it's uh, kind of incredible that um, one of the prolific uh, movers and shakers in some of the developments going on uh, is using uh, a hacker alias from uh, my favorite movie ever, which is Hackers. Um, uh, they are, uh, and yeah, they... They were the ones responsible for getting a whole bunch of parlor uh, information off of the parlor app and spreading it for everyone to, uh, you know, catch terrorists and stuff. So I am 
in in high spirits, and I think they deserve a uh, uh, a shout out for it. Their Twitter is uh, donk underscore e n b y. Nice, Dom. Do you have any shout outs to give to someone or recognize someone today? Um, yeah, I would like to shout out to uh, Jen Kretschmer and Amy Vorpal and all the wonderful storytellers that were uh, featured in the latest D&D release, the Candlekeep Mysteries. Um, I think it's really awesome that they did some really cool stuff with, with, with those things. And I, I'm just super proud of, of my friends that got to be in it. So yeah. My shout out is going to be to my boardroom angels and boardroom devils, <laughs> Because, oh my god, it's so surreal that this one shot that we played is now a whole LARP, and the role-playing from everyone there is phenomenal. You could take one minute of that hour of role-play, and it's so watchable, and I am so proud of that cast. Like, both casts. Like, collectively, they are a cast as well. So, so shout-out to them for, for doing things, and hopefully... Uh, they may be able to do um, other things in the future, uh, if or especially some of our newer role players that have been introduced in that game. It's been right. a lot of fun to play in. It really has. And watching the Devils is solid, solid choices to watch if you guys haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. All right. So let's address today's topic, how to produce an RPG stream. This has been something that a lot of people have asked many of us uh either individually or as a group especially since lockdown people have been looking for more creative avenues to do but a lot of people are a little afraid of going out there and i'm afraid to make a thing and i'm afraid that no one's going to watch but i have these ideas so we're here to first of all support people and content creators especially during this time of lockdown to go make the thing so let's help you go make the thing but let's figure out how do we start making a thing but before we do that let's go around the table and just talk about a little bit of our own producing experiences so that we can sort of help you understand where we're coming from when it comes to making a thing. I'm going to start off with our guest Dom Zook about um, producing uh, Saving Throw and some of your experiences in making a thing. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I've, I've been a producer for uh, of various things um, since, um, well, since, since, since I could, could produce things, <laughs> I suppose, but I've been doing short films and everything since, you know, like 2004 or something like that. And um, uh, I started the Saving Throw channel um, in 2014, technically. Uh, and so I've been producing RPG streams since then uh, and um, just learning everything under the sun. And I work I do freelance as like a technical director and producer on streams for other people. Uh, and yeah. Nice. Um, Sin, what things have you produced? Because I know you have a uh, list full. <laughs> yeah. So uh, contrary to what some people might know or think, um, I actually graduated with a bachelor's degree in fine arts and dance. And part of uh, our training there was actually to produce um, shows or different parts of, of live shows. So from there, I moved on to helping out with a very uh, well-known masquerade ball in Southern California called uh, Labyrinth of Jareth. That's actually how I met Ryan and Kai. Uh -huh. um, I spent a decade of my life uh, working on that show from being a dancer to a choreographer to ultimately producer of one of the uh, rooms in there. Um, and then obviously uh, helping out bringing uh, life action role play is, is one, of the, one of the other things. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the, the silent people behind life, life action role play. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, I haven't done too much like uh, streaming um, in terms of producing streaming, but like I've, I've always been there to consult with anybody who needs so Hi. Um, so apparently, I guess this counts, but uh, I have, uh, as uh, quite a few of our listeners know, I've been running Dystopia Rising, uh, both live games uh, for a solid year before COVID, 
Um, and I've also been running quite a few games during COVID. Um, and with that, I've been going the online format. So we have had to drastically change how we present, excuse me, uh, present and uh, continue to keep people engaged and entertained. Um, anytime you step onto the online uh, forum instead of uh, like physical, um, everything changes. At least that's what I've found. Um, so that's that's my main point of experience. Uh, but I do have a bit of experience being a uh, one of one of the co-producers of uh, one of the Maze Arcana shows. Uh, but that was uh, quite a bit in the past. Um, and uh, hopefully there will be other things on the horizon for us to play around with. So, And for me, uh, the biggest thing was doing Labyrinth Masquerade along with Sin. Again, that's where Sin, Kai, and I met. So I was the line producer uh, for a long time. I was the second command, essentially, for running this large um, event, Masquerade Ball, in L.A. And then... Uh, I started this podcast for life action role play along with Sin because Sin came to me during a party and said, we need to make a thing. We need to make a podcast. <laughs> so she's the one that kind of pushed me into what? I see you wagging your finger. What is yeah, this? Yeah, because actually it was you who mentioned it and you're like, yeah, it's just an idea. And I was like, you need to do it. You need to do it. And you're it's... like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. So I called you the next day. It was like, so are you doing this? <laughs> It's because I imagined that when I had to do this by myself, it's like no one's gonna watch. Who's gonna who's gonna watch me do a thing? And just having someone else, having a host partner and a role playing partner like Sin was the reason why I was able to eventually go forward. And then also going forward, I was a producer for Maze Arcana for a few shows. I did um, Arcana High as one of those shows, and then. From the podcast during lockdown, we have Joe Paloma, who's the TD here, and he knew the OBS system. And because of that, we were able to make shows on Twitch. And so he's the reason why we now have a Twitch show. So there's a progression in all of that, that sometimes producing is a career in a way. But if you look at all of the different producers here, producing is also interdisciplinary. Like you can produce a show, you can produce an event, you can produce many things. They're not all exactly the same, but some of the tenets uh, are very, very similar. And I think, uh, let's start off with, I guess, where do we start uh, trying to tell, uh, trying to advise people, how do you make a show? Um, I'm gonna throw this out to everyone here. Where would you start? So I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's worth noting that when we started Life Action Roleplay, we didn't do it with the intent of we've got to get followers and we've got to like have a viewership. Um, so I think usually successful shows, at least that I've seen, come from a place of heart and a place of we just want to get together and do the thing. And if people want to come watch, cool. But if you approach it with the I have to have followers, you may not feel as successful as if you were just to do it for the love of it. So I would say that that's my first recommendation is make sure that you pick something that you're passionate and excited to do. Otherwise, you may feel like you're you're, you're failing at it. I, uh, I was about to say uh, something along those lines, like pick people that you are comfortable working with, like pick, do it with your friends, make sure that you're having fun. The only way that you are going to have an enter, the best way to entertain people is if you yourself are having fun as well. Uh, and as long as you just maintain that air of fun, being inclusive and productive, uh, you will, uh, you will, you will enjoy yourself. And if you're enjoying yourself, that will attract people. And if it doesn't, you had fun. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I have a slight, um, diff I have a different, slightly different take, um, yeah. than, than that, <laughs> but I think that it's really important as, uh, Sin and Kai both said that you do something that you, uh, enjoy a lot because you're going to be really, really, really deep into it once you start getting going, especially if you're trying to produce and you're aiming for something that, um, you know, you want to get out there and you want to build an audience and do it as an entertainment um, uh, for other people. And I think that uh, my slightly different take is that if you are producing something for 
people to watch, you have to consider not just what you enjoy doing, but also what the audience is going to be seeing of that. And so there's, there's a slightly different sort of take to it that you can't, it's important that you do what you enjoy, because if you don't enjoy it, it's not something that you would watch. Well, you know, like they say, you do, do something that you would watch or something that you would do. And so you kind of have to take that as, as your basis, but it's important to have in mind that you, people will be watching this. And um, if you want to have an, an, the entertainment factor, you kind of have to be considerate of that as you build the, the process. Like, I think, I think that's a, that's a key component um, to, to this whole thing. Cause it's very easy to set up cameras and get a microphone and sit around the dinner table and start streaming something. But is that interest, is, is there a purpose? Uh, so I think finding that goal, uh, that initial goal, like, what do you want to do? You want to get 10 people watching you at a time? Do you want to be able to broadcast this? So family or friends from around the world can watch your game? You know, what, what is your the purpose for putting this on the internet. And if your purpose is to entertain other people and develop a following, then keep that in mind as, as you put it together. I think you're very spot on with the, would you watch the stuff that you make? That's right. such an important <laughs> thing because a lot of people don't like, as soon as they put it up there, it's like, okay, now it's not time to make the next show. And it's something that I keep in mind whenever I think of things like Blank Slate, which I made in the past, but also Boardroom Angels and Boardroom Devils. Like after I'm done making this show, I do watch it a couple of times because I actually just straight enjoy it. Um, and it's really important that we get to not only just the producing part, but the answer is you kind of want to be entertaining and especially do you enjoy the things that you make? Um, I would also say, uh, you want a good source of inspiration. You want a strong concept. Usually that is at the heart of the game. Like if you want to produce an RPG show, it's because you have a strong affinity to a story within an RPG system. And if you're trying to, uh, and if you are using that story pro to propel things, then it th makes things more engaging. But if you're just trying to say, please watch me because I'm doing a thing, it doesn't feel as authentic to entertainment other than I'm showing off myself. I don't know if that sounds weird, but I do see people getting disappointed when they put on things and people don't watch because they are putting it for the purpose of wanting to be seen, even though I do understand and would definitely validate those feelings because I think many of us who are content creators want to make a thing. But if you have a good story, if, they, if you have a good pitch, that is, what's make, that, that is what makes people want to see, they want to join you in the story uh, more than just, you know, let's just watch them make a thing. I love the idea that in Twitch, you can include people, you can include your audience. And like even watching now, I could see the stream chat and we could see the questions and they could ask us questions right now. It's something that you need to consider in building your game, especially if it's interactive on Twitch. And that's a decision that is also a decision you must make. Are you going to choose to interact with your audience or is it going to be something that the game master is going to interact only with their panel? So that, that yeah. was actually a question that I wanted to ask, but it sounded like Kai wanted to ask a question first. Sure. I had I had a statement and a question real quick. Um, bouncing off what you were saying uh, there, Ryan, uh, I'd also go so far as to say, like, sincerity really sells it. Like, if, if you are trying to make something entertaining because you want to get popular, it's going to be a much more different and difficult journey than... Uh, having like a genuine intent to just entertain people because you enjoy it as well. Like there, there's a lot of different motivators and, you know, correctly tapping your creativity there is important. The question that I have for you, Dom, um, obviously there are major differences between running uh, a tabletop game, uh, you know, for your friends and running a game for hundreds of viewers on the internet. Um, 
do you have any insight on what some of uh like the the biggest uh like hurdles there could be yeah i mean and and even bouncing off of the the earlier question um i think it's really important to um again have that concrete idea of what you're wanting to present uh and and how you want to do it and building that plan of what you want to do because like you said having insincerity in 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 creation is is um it, it's not going to help anybody and uh i think if your goal is to get fans and viewers you will never reach that goal if your goal is to produce high quality content that you enjoy and makes makes a statement that you want to make you'll go a lot further that way and the viewers will come. Uh, and once they come, then you can start developing an audience, you know, outreach program and all of that stuff. But I, for me, a lot of times people come to me and they say, oh, I've got, you know, a few of my friends and we think we're funny and we're going to throw a d d game up on the internet. And um, I think, great, do it. Absolutely. Why not? But again, you have to go, go back and go, why are you doing this? You know, what, what exactly about your home game do you think other people want to watch? Or are you just doing it to record it? And if it's out and people tend to like it, great. That's a super healthy way of looking at it. Um, but if you're like, me and my friends are kind of funny, just like the Critical Role people are funny, I think we can do it, you know? Uh, that's probably not the best outlook to take. <laughs> so I know when we started, like we took a really heavy look into how we casted the, 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 the parts. Like we didn't tell anybody what to make or anything. When we very first started, we were doing a D and D game and we didn't tell them, you know, make a balanced party so that we can show off all these things. Everyone made what they wanted to make, but we made sure that the players were people that had good chemistry and could bounce off of each other. And uh, to this day, that's the key for me for, for saving throw is, is in our casting and who we put together because you can play any game and you can make any game interesting and watchable if you have the right people to play it. Um, uh, I mean, we can get into real specifics with systems that work well for streaming and systems that don't work well for streaming, but I think ultimately it, it is dependent on who you have around you and who you are playing with. And uh, for a lot of people that are just starting out, it's they just have a little community that they've built around themselves and that's what they have to work with. I don't expect people to have, you know, a huge um, uh, line of uh, potential players and, and experienced streamers and stuff that they can go with. So um, work with what you have and, you'll start seeing things as you go because you're when you're streaming um it's really important that, that you have consistency and stuff and with home games a lot of times you are playing once every few months maybe um you know especially if you want if you can only play when everyone's in the same room together i mean right now that's you know it's impossible so uh you want to have a group of people that are going to be comfortable doing a a consistent stream uh, from week or, or every other week or whatever, and uh, can bring that high level of, of value of entertainment and, and drive and uh, everything and passion every week. Uh, Cause everyone basically is suddenly an actor uh, and a performer. And uh, I, I know a lot of people are not comfortable with that. And so it's, you got to think about that. Um, before you, you know, thrust your friends in front of the camera, think about how that's going to work. But so that's actually yeah. kind of one of my questions or was the thing that I wanted to pivot towards is that once you figure out kind of the content and I kind of want to touch on that too, how do you figure out what content you want to do? Do you want to do original stuff or do you want to go from um, a, a gaming system that you're already used to? But really my big question is how do you choose which platform to use, right? So most people tend to go, oh, I'm going to make something on, on Twitch. Well, Twitch might not always be the right gaming platform. Uh, one, if people are too camera shy, 
um, to actually want to show themselves off on on camera, or maybe you just don't have the the right equipment. So maybe a podcast version might be better if you guys are like more of a um, a funnier podcast. It, it might behoove you to do more more of a podcast version and show off your voices rather than try to do like the whole shebang. So I'm gonna put it out to you guys. Um, how do you guys choose which platform is better to host your content? For for me, for Saving Throw, um, I mean, our our goal is for a one of our tenets is a theatrical cinematic experience. So, mm -hmm. our our initial goal is is to to have something that can play um, similarly to a TV show. It's vastly different from a television show. It's it's a three hour long television show every week, you know. Uh, so there's the the it's not quite equal but um that's our goal is to have something that that looks and feels and really envelops the the viewer in the relationships and the action and um uh but we've taken to moving a lot of those to podcasts and just sort of doing that just just so that people who can't watch have an easier way of of getting into it but i think it is important hundred percent. I, I think that podcasts are, are a great way to sort of test out the waters and get yourself to a, a place that um, you feel comfortable with the equipment, with the work involved um, and, and how everything gets sort of put together. And without the, the, the um, ever present audience just right there um, <laughs> chatting at you, uh, you can kind of play with that a bit. So yeah, we, I mean, we look to things, we don't produce anything specifically for podcasts, but, um, but that's always something in our, in our minds is how we present the stuff. So we've changed a little bit of how we describe things and what we show on, you know, we can have elaborate layouts around the table when we could do that. Uh, but uh, that doesn't help someone who's, you know, watching or listening to it rather. And um, so we've taken to, okay, we'll describe this and, and, and everything. And it's helped because it does create kind of a, um, almost a radio play kind of feeling to it where you, you can envision what we are seeing too, by, by describing it like that. But yeah, I think it's really important to, to understand the platform that you're going to take. Almost like a, a multi-person audio book or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, Kai, I understand um, for DR, you guys are starting to run things on Discord. Am I correct? Yeah, um, Discord is a really good format for running uh, larger number uh, kind of games. Uh, the weirdness that we get up to is um, I feel like we run role-playing, uh, like our online LARP, the format that we handle it, is more kind of like a multi-user dungeon or an MMORPG. Um, but more in the realm that there are like non-combat combat public areas where everyone can kind of get together and talk and we can send NPCs in to kind of disseminate information and deliver things. Uh, and then groups of players band together and go off and go, uh, go on an adventure. And that's what we refer to on behind the scenes as a module, uh, which is really common to the like D and D kind of uh, phrasing as well on it. So can I ask real quick, um, when you have the mass groups, is it through text based on on Discord, or are you guys utilizing the the video function for that? Here's something I think is really really fascinating about the differences in gamer culture, because the uh, the the difference in gamer culture between East and West Coast is actually really huge, uh, but not in like any kind of like language barrier kind of manner. East Coast is much more driven on text and West Coast is much more driven on voice and especially video chat. And while we lean heavily into enabling our players to like dress up and feel more like they're actually LARPing so they can emote and express and they have their costumes and everything. Um, while we actively like encourage and reward that, um, we're one of the few Dystopia Rising games in the network that actually leans super hard into that. So some of uh, the players from other games will visit our games and be surprised. And I've even gotten like private messages from some of those players being like, oh, I love this, give me like 20 minutes. And they rush off and they, go, they put on their whole <laughs> costume and then turn their webcam on and they're super hyped about it. 
um, which is kind of cool. I, there's a lot of different ways of running and engaging with players and doing things. Um, yeah, which I love. But we don't stream any of that. Like we don't. Our audience is still very intimate with the fact that we are doing what we're doing for the players, rather than trying to, you know, transmit that to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the fact that we have a ticketed event and anyone can come and play. Yeah, I, I've been running uh, mods for for Twin Mask, and I've been kind of doing the similar concept where they've been doing more text based stuff within um, Discord. Mm -hmm. When I take my mod, I'll actually put a Zoom link in and have them. Um, they all love dressing up, just as as you suggested. Um, and I actually roll. Um, I use the Roll Twenty app, and I uh, play ambient music um, while I'm 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 doing the stuff too. So like video, everyone loves it and dressing up. <laughs> I I definitely would like at not immediately, but I would love to pivot to uh like people like us sharing some of the tools, like the software that we all use to achieve certain things. Uh so we can give recommendations to our viewers. Uh but yeah, like I involving uh just like a LARP or any other kind of game, the more of the senses that you can engage when you're playing a, uh any kind of immersive experience, the better. Um, so like having that background ambience and music and things, people eat that shit up because it feels like a video game. It feels like a movie and it brings you and pulls you into the world even better. Um, so we've talked about Twitch and we've talked about running things on Discord. Ryan, you had the unique experience of running things through Instagram and you've done obviously Zoom. Can you talk about a little bit of your experience of doing multi like crazy platforms all at like one time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's start off with um, running things on Instagram. That was a platform we were not really expecting to do when we were doing the D and D Live 2020, and we were doing a reality RP. So we were challenged to use Instagram as a platform because the out of character consideration was D and D uh, Wizards of the Coast was trying to grow their Dungeons and Dragons presence on Instagram. So we were like, okay, so let's use that. How do we incorporate that into the running of a show? And so it had some interesting things about it. Uh, you can have the longer, um, I guess, role, uh, what the IGTV sessions, so that you can actually have it's almost like a long form TikTok, essentially, is what you were doing. But we were using Instagram. However, Instagram at that point in time was a lot more accessible to a lot of the player base at the time. In fact, they were debating, should we use Instagram? Should we use TikTok? We ultimately decided on Instagram because it was something that was more comfortable within the Dungeons and Dragons um, base, even though Dungeons and Dragons didn't have a large presence, but they did immediately after D&D Live. Um, so it was interesting to do that, but it definitely had some limitations. It meant that everything that all the players had to do was very visual. It meant that uh, we had to think about how do you portray that kind of a story. And the players were kind of genius in terms of creating little videos for people to watch and then sharing that and then other characters reacting to those videos. So again, it was, it was similar to TikTok in that respect. Um, but we just happen to be using Instagram for Zoom, in this case for Game Over Video Chat, which is on Tuesdays here on this channel, I purposely stripped down everything to look exactly like a Zoom call. And the reason for that is it was important that we were playing micro RPGs that were accessible to other people. So these are for people that were uh, intimidated intimidated by rule books like D, D pathfinder vampire the masquerade like i i don't think they can do the it's people who think they can't do these 200 page 300 page rule books but they can totally do five pages but in order to convey that it was important that we don't do a layout just make it zoom just have the labels change it over as we need to and play as close to the zoom function taking advantage of the actual uh platform that was there so that inspires people to be able to play those games themselves so that was a conscious choice to be able to um, do the zoom format and in zoom you have things such as breakout rooms where you can go into a different thing and in fact um joe our technical director and dom uh eric 
and myself from Indicate, we kind of had to figure out how to use those breakout rooms when we were all doing Indicate and breakout rooms just came out that week. <laughs> so that was something new when it comes to being able to use different platforms. And even now, there are still evolutions on how you can get that platform to be interactive in terms of a role play. So even though we talk about Zoom, Discord, uh, Twitch, YouTube, any of these things, there are infinite more choices. It's just a matter of how do you wish to present it and what do you wish to convey? Awesome. So um, we have several questions from chat. Um, but to catch Kai's point, let's pivot to more of the production side. Now that you figured out what platform you want to use, let's go get into the, the techie software side of things. So um, the easier, I, I, I don't know a lot about the technology of it, so I'm really fascinated. But I can tell you that the setup, as someone who's on a camera, um, is, is, is a pretty basic need, right? You need lighting, you need a, a decent webcam, and sometimes a green screen. And sometimes you can literally be challenged by your green screen. We all know this and have problems. So the way you balance your green screen and, and lighting is also very interesting. However, comma, let's talk about the software and stuff like that to make your stream happen. Kai, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I'm, I'm really interested. Uh, in what type of uh, tech, you know, software uh, type stuff that people get up to. Because I have a couple of small recommendations that I found really fun and entertaining. Uh, but I think uh, looking towards uh, Dom for some, uh, you know, some of the some of the the essentials and really whatever, however you feel like answering this, dude. Yeah. I'd just love <laughs> yeah. to love to hear more of your opinions about uh, some of this kind of topic stuff. So go nuts, please. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that the key to anything is a good microphone um, because uh, there's a really classic um, uh, film, uh, um, I don't know, uh, adage basically that, that people will watch bad video or yeah, people will watch bad video as long as they can hear it well, um, basically. Uh, so if you have bad audio, no one is going to stick around. Um, it's just it, the, the human brain just cannot process bad audio. So uh, I recommend if when you're just starting out, you can get whatever cheap webcam you want. Um, any, you know, anything else you can kind of cheap out on, but the microphone should be pretty decent. Um, and uh, that's usually where I start. Um, I'm using an Elgato Wave, uh, which is really nice for me because I'm doing a lot of production work. I'm balancing a lot of audio and it comes with software that allows me to play with different uh, things. It basically gives me a bunch of different options of routing audio and stuff like that. It's not necessary for a lot of people, but for, for me it is. Um, but, uh, you know, I've used the Blue Yetis, Blue Snowballs, um, I've used a ton of, you know, um, uh, lavalier microphones and, and in our studio we use uh, Rode mics and uh, stuff like that. So there's a lot of different um, places you can go with audio, but uh, I, just, I just say, check out some reviews, see what your budget is, put, put your budget towards that first. Uh, because if nothing else, you can do your podcast and, and it will be great, but um, it, it will really help with that. Um, can, I, can I add in real quick? It's also yeah. worth noting that you could also use um, um, uh, gaming headphones that have the mic in it. That, that also yeah. has a really good mic. I will say a con because I always get this problem is be careful that you don't breathe into your mic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of people have it up here and they just <sighs> uh, breathe right into it. So yeah, yeah uh, you got to be aware of that. But yeah, um, that, that can work super well. Um, uh, with, with cameras, I have next to my nice camera, I have a Logitech C920, which is sort of the workhorse of, of, of it all. Um, and it, it's super great, but, um, 
I, I highly recommend it, but if you want to step up, then you can go to like a DSLR type camera that has a, a, a lens that you can take on and off and switch out and stuff. That will give you nice sort of depth of field and, and a much higher quality image, but then you have to start worrying about lighting and all of that stuff because they don't work so well in low light, whereas the, the Logitech is, is designed for most environments. Um, in terms of software, uh, my favorite is OBS Studio. Uh, and there's a few different flavors of, of open broadcast software uh, out there. There's Streamlabs, OBS, uh, affectionately called Slobs, um, and other, <laughs> other uh, uh, Twitch has their own kind of version of it as well uh, now. But uh, I like OBS Studio mainly because uh, there are a ton of plugins that you can get for it that bring it up to a, a quality level uh, that rivals a lot of uh, professional grade software out there. I've used uh, TriCaster, vMix, Wirecast, XSplit. I've used, I've used pretty much all of them, but OBS Studio still for me uh, uh, has a really good balance of what you need technologically to create your stuff and ease of use. So um, I highly recommend OBS Studio. Um, so people really like Streamlabs OBS. I think it's great. Uh, it, it's, it really is a one and done solution uh, type of thing, but you start hitting a limit with what you're capable of doing with it. Uh, and so OBS Studio gives you just a little bit more freedom, but at, uh, at a higher cost of, of technical level. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I... Um, that's sort of, I don't know, software wise, I've used a bunch of different things. I've used like voice meter to try to, to uh, arrange different audio tracks, but the Elgato does it so much better <laughs> if you're trying to do that. Um, voice meter is a really, really, really uh, difficult um, program to get used to, but uh, yeah, um, I think just starting out, get a decent microphone, get a decent webcam, uh, and uh, get OBS and essentially you're ready to go. Uh, it, it's this very low cost of entry, which is why there are so many people who are getting into it. And, and Zoom, you know, uh, you could just start up with Zoom. Um, so that it's pretty, pretty straightforward. But when you start getting into it a little bit, like I use OBS Ninja, uh, which is a, uh, it's a Zoom alternative essentially, um, which, gives me individual sources for all of the people so that uh, rather than um, Zoom gives me one window of everybody that I can cut away from. But if someone goes out, someone drops their connection or something like that, everyone gets all, you know, switched all over. Whereas with OBS Ninja, they're all their individual cameras essentially and individual audio. So I can adjust everyone individually uh, through that. It's, it's a work in progress, but, uh, it is a, it's a, it's free. Uh, so it's, it's the price is right, uh, as it were, and it works very well with OBS. So that's a, that's a really handy piece of software, but there's also fun stuff like snap cam, uh, and voice mod, which are great for people who like GMs who want to, you know, have an effect like play a monster or uh, a Titan or uh, a vampire or something like that. And there are, uh, you know, basically filters that can go over your camera uh, to give that effect off and you can change your voice using voice mod and uh, just I would just like to endorse, endorse uh, voice mod programs. They're super fun to play around with. See? <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick on that note, also what's really fun to play with, it was uh, a game that I was playing in was when you were in different rooms, um, you can indicate the different room that you're in by changing your background so that you can tell what characters were where and if they were off screen, they would be in like the like black space or whatever. I thought that was really effective storytelling wise. Mm. And then like, if your character wanted to walk into that room, all you do is just select that background and automatically your character come in and every player knew to acknowledge that that person had just walked in the room. I thought that was really cool and effective. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Green, green yeah. screens have been an amazing, uh, I, the ubiquity of them and the ability to use them easily with Zoom and stuff has really made them uh, you know, almost essential for, for 
our, our stuff. I mean, it, it really helps us tell the stories that we want to tell and opens up. I mean, I've got a lot of ideas of <laughs> things to use for, for green screens. That's I also like OBS Ninja because it gives me a really high quality video feed from everybody and I can actually key out their green screen um, so I can control what goes behind them, which means that we have a much higher uh, uh quality control basically of what's going on behind people. So if we want to put them all in the same room, I just have to hit a button and suddenly their entire background is all different. Um, oh, that's cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it can be really fun, but, um, but you know, that's, I, I would not start with that stuff. I would get a zoom call going Google meets discord, whatever you've got handy, whatever people are comfortable using. And you'll eventually start seeing where your, uh, where the weaknesses are in those programs and and there are options out there there's there's a ton of people who are doing this all over the place so yeah yeah um i'm going to use my magical powers and i'm going to summon a joe uh, <laughs> because joe who's the technical director and also behind a whole bunch of tech for life action role play definitely has some insight um has creatively played with some of the layouts as well as trying to figure out some of the configurations of how a tech is going to work. So Joe, out of, uh, Joe, uh, do you have any, I guess, input or advice uh, to be followed up with what Donna said? Joe? Joe's muted. You are muted. Oh. <laughs> Perfect, this is our tech guy. <laughs> No, I don't think so. Yeah, you are you are totally clear and fine. Okay. There we go. I have to turn on the mute on the Streamlabs. I'm not usually talking while the Zoom call is happening, so that is something I have learned today. There's lots of things you always learn when you're doing a lot of this. It's like you you figure out some settings or from um like oh you could do something a certain way that you didn't know that you could do before that's something um I, earlier there was a question about how uh about how much of the overlay affects the presentation and really it it, it does make it easier to look at but really it should be about the story and the gameplay and then the characters that the players are doing i do a show um with uh, Nat 20 Productions called uh, Edge of Legend. And they started out very simple with a, uh, a Zoom uh, setup with just a couple of, of things. And then as they progressed in um, in their, their production, like they had a budget to hire someone to uh, create a, a fancy overlay, it, it added to their performance. Um, you can find overlays like templates on in, in Streamlabs OBS. They have stream uh, uh, overlay templates that you can use, and then you can just alter it to how you want your your thing to be presented as. Um, in Twitch, it's a lot more gaming oriented, so the people are more expecting the flashy looks. But uh, as long as you can portray your story and have like a solid um, base that like isn't too distracting it's, it's it's more about the players than the the overlay itself and yeah uh, i i use streamlabs obs for the shows that i i run uh for the technical directing because it's, it's easier in a if i have to switch from one to the other they save the uh the overlays which is really nice if i switch a computer or something it, it'll keep the overlays um and and combination with OBS for various uh, back end things like uh, camera work. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, I just wanted to jump in a little bit. 
So it was interesting that um, a lot of uh, people just like said, hey, we, uh, we can't hear Joe and he's our technical director. But here's the thing about the setup for OBS as well as Zoom. One of the complicated things about using all, oh, I'm, there's an echo happening now. Oh, yeah, it might be the snowball. Wait, we're in the same room. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so I mean, that's the thing that also happens when it comes to doing these things. Um, for example, Joe and I are roommates. He is literally four feet away from me. So if we have our mics both on at the same time, you're going to hear that echo. Uh, the other thing uh, that has been a complication for me that I eventually had to learn in OBS is that, okay, you can't hear the sound. Okay, is it the OBS? Yes. Uh, or is it? Or no, okay, is it the Zoom? No. Is it my computer? No. Is it the mic? Is the right microphone selected? No. Is it the voice meter attached on the program that's also connected everything? No. Okay. Um, did I did I install the right device? Uh can I add driver? real quick it that's also uh, asked a question. Do I have roll 20 on? <laughs> There is a lot to go through when even do when whenever doing the tech. And as Dom said, um, you know, a lot of people uh, can watch bad video, but they won't sit through a lot. They won't th sit through bad audio. In fact, when I used to be a judge at a independent film festival, we had that was a rule that we had. If it had six seconds of bad audio the moment it started, we tossed it out. It wasn't even oh. worth judging because no one's going to sit through it. But people will sit through snow distorted images in the beginning because that could be part of the show. But it can, but bad audio, forget it. You really do need strong audio or make sure that audio works in whatever format it is, whether it's podcast, live stream, anything. The audio must work. Uh, something that you will have to be ready for is technical difficulties. <laughs> and if you're doing a stream and it's a lot of technology and a lot of moving parts, you have to be ready to adjust on the fly. Like even um, high end like streams will have some technical difficulties and you have to stay calm and just look at the situation and adjust. Um, it helps to be really familiarized with how everything works together, but that is something that no matter the stream, there's always, you always have to be prepared for something that can happen. There's also nothing wrong with trying to, at least to start off with, or otherwise, um, if something isn't really working, um, you know, keeping it simple is a merit in its own, um, I, for example, love D20 uh, through D&D Beyond, but I, I do not use it, uh, at least, uh, or Roll20, that's what I was meaning. I don't use Roll20 when I'm running my Dystopia Rising games. I do it entirely theater of the mind because I find it's the most flexible and fluid way of running a game for people without getting bogged down with the technicalities of everyone moving everywhere, especially if your players aren't that familiar with the software. All, all right. Um, we're going to go into rapid fire questions. Sin, do you want to like lead this one? Because you're really good at this. <laughs> yeah, I got this. I got to scroll up. There's quite, quite a bit of uh, <laughs> questions from the top. Do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Again, so this is rapid fire. So this is responding as quick and controlled as possible. If you guys have any follow on questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. But we're going we're gonna to be moving quick. Um, do, -ba -do, -ba -do, -ba -do, -ba -do, do you want me to post them right now to you as a repost at the bottom of the screen? Sure, I got, it, go. I got the, the top, yeah. Oh, did you put all of them? No, I just put the uh, first one down and then I'll post the rest as we go. Okay. All right. Awesome. Cool. Let me just start from where Kai's going then. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we are co-hosts. Yes. All right, so uh, question. In your experience, how much of an impact does a slick quality of overlay editing OBS mastery impact the audience? In other words, if the role playing and storytelling are great, is that 70% of the effort, 90% of the effort? Have you noticed a greater or lesser amount of shallowness in the kind of potential audience members that check out role-playing streams? That's open to everybody, and I believe that was from Chris Montgomery. 
uh, I will say um, your the overlay editing OBS mastery um, is not is almost negligible. You can literally just put up a, a zoom window if your players are engaging. Um, if you have an engaging story, engaging role play, you're able to do combat um, and and the mechanics quickly. Um, uh, you don't need uh, anything fancy. Um, one of the largest D and D streamers they're streaming right now to almost four thousand people. They have no uh, no cams. Um, uh, they're talking over each other all the time. It's just a roll twenty page. Uh, so don't get hung up on having beautiful overlays and smooth transitions and all of that stuff that that will come. Uh, but yeah, I don't, it is not, it is not necessary uh, from the get go. I will say that it matters only if you really care about that type of presentation. But I will also say that when you do get random raids or random people wandering in, it will affect some of those people because they don't know what they're looking at yet if they sit around long enough then they'll get it but some people only will give it 10 seconds of impression and then it's like well i'm gonna go somewhere else so yeah. for that's for that small group that's where that matters my my response leads into the next question so go ahead and read the next question okay. <laughs> oh, right. um yeah, let me uh, yeah. yeah, real quick. Uh, I'm I'm a big supporter of visuals, but when it comes down to D and D streams of any kind, well, role play streams of any kind of variety, um, your visuals at most are going to pull people in, and your content is what keeps them always. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, as as a player, I got really annoyed that my camera didn't look as crisp as everybody else so like during like holidays i was like shopping for all the things and the same thing Keeping with audio up with the neighbors yeah pretty much uh <laughs> just it, it, as a player it gets really frustrating like to like have so many technical errors because of maybe like your your equipment didn't like match up so like i i would say as an aesthetic person like i went for the quality stuff all right <laughs> So Eric Jackson writes, um, is D and D five E becoming oversaturated? It seems that there are a hundred of five E streams online. Um, can I can I start with that one? Um, I don't think there's ever a point that things are oversaturated. Yes, there could be a lot, but I think it's freaking awesome that everybody's making so much great content. Like I feel like there's a lot. Like as soon as LA by Night came out for for Vampire, like all of a sudden Vampire like exploded onto the scene. And I think that was the same thing when Critical Role started. Everybody was like, oh my god, like D and D is like the new cool thing, and everybody just started doing stuff. So. In terms of oversaturation, I don't, I don't, I think oversaturation is probably more of a negative term. I would say that it's just really awesome uh, that there's an explosion of content, period, and you get to find and pick and choose um, the type of game that you want to watch. That's a lot of variety to it. But even, uh, I, Dom, you were mentioning about like, you know, there are some systems that you think have a natural predisposition to be better or uh, worse for uh, the ease of actually doing a show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, from the last question, I would say, if you are doing a 5e stream, do try to make it look a little bit different from every other 5e stream out there, just because, yeah, that look is really going to help you uh, f differentiate from everyone else. But um, yeah, there are systems that just don't translate well to an online experience. Um, uh, I, I will say Shadowrun is just one of those things where the story, the lore, yeah, it's awesome, but it's, but the system the mechanics are impossible uh you have to be around a table you have to be counting up you know all these things and yes you could do that stuff in roll 20 but it's just the amount of it is there's just so much to it the crunch level takes viewers out uh any game that has a very um um uh, crunchy combat system I say is, is something to kind of step away from but there are some systems that work really well I really love Savage Worlds I will be a, a huge Savage Worlds advocate um, I think Savage Worlds is a perfect streaming RPG uh, uh, D&D's oh, no, great play in a Solomon Kane setting so much oh yeah be a lot that's of fun it, it, it's so fantastic um, uh, yeah so I, I I do think that there are good and a lot of the um, uh, GM-less uh, systems and dice-less systems, role-playing heavy systems are great because, you know, that's, it's much easier to facilitate a role-playing atmosphere and, and dialogue and discourse than it is to, you know, go back and forth between combat and 
uh, role play and some people aren't comfortable with the role play and just prefer the mechanics. It's really to each their own, what, what excites you, what you want to do, but, but uh, in terms of enticing an audience and keeping an audience, the heavier mechanic systems are gonna be harder to keep that audience engaged. I will say that there is one aspect in which D&D 5e is oversaturated, and that is this, there's an element in Twitch that if your show on a particular time slot is listed as a D&D show, and several others are listed as D&D show, there is unfortunately this unequivalence where if you see one D&D show, which is 20 people um, attending, one which is 50 and then one which is 100 most people who are watching or just jumping in don't know anything about any of the DD shows so they will naturally all go to the 100 and so you now have this inverted pyramid of if you have a ton of people you'll continue to grow with a lot more people and if you're on the bottom with not as many people it's much harder to get up there so in that strange aspect if you are trying to get a whole mass of people just to watch. Um, Twitch, um, unfortunately, throws people towards the bigger pools. That's why it is so incredibly important to make sure that your D&D setting or cast or whatever is distinct. There has to be something that distinguishes you from everything else. Not to mention that establishing your first like 20, 50 or 100 uh, like actual followers who regularly watch you on the regular are by far the hardest thing to do when it comes to all of this. Um, once you get past those milestones, it exponentially becomes easier. Uh, but getting those first like establishments of fan base is uh, kind of the make or break for the longevity of a show that is very driven on ratings. Mm -hmm. On? All mm -hmm. right. So next question is um, OC by night. Uh, what are the pros and cons of live versus pre-recorded RPG streams? I have an opinion as a person on the shows. Um, I'm not sure if it's different for, for GMs or producers, but um, I, I very much um, prefer pre-recorded games to live. Um, I am not a voice actor by any means, or rather I'm, I'm not much of an actor. I am a dancer who is a performer who dabbles in acting. Um, so I like uh, pre-recorded because if I say something weird or wrong or like get a rule wrong, you can always like kind of like cut and like rewind that back and like say it again versus live stream where um, your mistakes are seen. <laughs> your mistakes are commented on um so live does provide its um opportunity challenges live like are always awesome and, and fun to to participate in but man pre-recorded is like a sweet spot we um, we, we mostly do uh live uh i mean 98 percent of our content is live uh, we have released one pre-recorded stream uh and um uh, pre they both have pros and cons. Absolutely. Um, I mean, a pro for a live stream is, you know, there's no editing that you have to do. It's out and about and in the world and, um, you can quickly share it and get it out there. Uh, and, uh, everyone can see the system and your players warts and all. Um, and so hmm. depending on what you're going for, that, that might be great. Uh, with a pre-recorded stream, uh, as Sin was saying, yeah, you can cut it, uh, you can cut around things, you can remove ums and ahs, you can get things really tight and concise so that you can uh, have a, a package. Like a lot of people, it's very difficult to watch a three hour plus long show. Uh, and we run into that all the time with our shows. Um, some of our shows are longer than that. Uh, and we've been working backwards to try and, you know, squeeze things into like a couple hours and stuff. But even that's pretty long. Uh, but we did a show where we did a essentially live recording and then we edited all of those recordings down into little hour chunks. Uh, mm. and, it, and it really helped um, sort of facilitate that sort of cinematic feel because we cut out everything that was that was unnecessary anytime we had to break and check out a rule or anything like that, we could cut that out. We could try something uh, new. And that's something I, I watched. I watched a, a recording of Harmon Quest one time. And, you know, that's the same thing. They're playing it live. They're, they're, it's not scripted or anything like that. But at the end, 
the 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 cameras come or the cameras keep rolling and the audience is still there but the the crew is going like can you redo this line you said this this way can you say it another way so that they can have that perfect moment and it and it presents that that sort of perfect atmosphere it's all in the time that you have if you don't have the time to edit like i don't have the time to edit then pre-recorded is just out of the picture especially if you're running you know four or five streams a week but um beyond that like if if you're looking for the best if, if you want to really have that that strong look and you want to have strong performances and all of the things that you can potentially do with editing like pre-recorded is is the way to go i've noticed that sometimes there's blowback uh on twitch uh when people are not live uh when there's a perception of it being live but it's not um and uh who cares <laughs> i don't care um about it but uh but yeah some people get really bent out of shape when it's not live um uh, recording also means that you uh you know if you've got availability problems with your your players or actors or depending on how you want to quantify them um it's easier to get them together if it's a recording because you can run on your schedule rather than specifically the show schedule for live events could I, could I add when we uh, recorded um, LA by Night our last season, where we recorded it in one week, um, there was a certain amount of um, intensity that went into because we were doing back to back episodes. So, like, you weren't able to truly um, conceptualize your consequences versus like when we did live shows, um, we would do it like weekly, right? So you had a whole week to digest like what your character did and be like, okay, I want to come back and try this. No, like this was like back-to-back -back episodes, boom, boom. So when we got to the last episode, like all of us were almost like, if you watch the, the season finale, we're all almost screaming at each other because of how like pent up we were about certain situations and we hadn't seen each other together until the last two episodes as like the full coterie so you actually do see like heightened emotions that come from us and also with the pre-recorded what was really cool is that when people started crying blood um blood tears from vampire we actually were able to like stop go paint on the blood tears that were coming out and then like restart again you can see the like, makeup the blood coming out. Yeah. yeah so i mean there is <laughs> totally benefit to doing pre-recorded and you still can get the live idea of these heightened energies by doing a, a um con What's the word I was going to use? A, a shortened schedule. I was going to use a smart word, but I couldn't find it right now. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the minority, and I'm, I feel like I'm in the minority of many games where I actually prefer doing things live. And it's for several Me reasons. No, I, do, I do that, yeah. But it's for several reasons. The biggest one is that I get to interact with the audience, and the audience gets to interfere and play with us. Like, this has been a thing that I've been kind of wanting to do and championing championing for like eight to ten years like ever since doing labyrinth one of the biggest things that i wanted to do as a producer was i remember seeing so many of the performers doing these isolated scenes and then you on the other side you see all of these audience watching them taking pictures and i was like why is no one interacting with each other it's really weird there's like small isolated incidents but there wasn't like anything to really indulge people or really make them believe and feel like you are actually part of our world for me it's always important to make sure that your audience is part of you because without an audience you do not have a show so therefore i'll always develop my shows to somehow encapsulate the audience and interact with that audience so that's generally why i tend to do what i do when it comes to uh, live versus pre-recorded. I am also conscious of the fact of not everyone can do three hours. That's why game over video chat is shorter. Games are one and a half to two hours long or even an hour long. They are short because not a lot of people has have the time to do that. The only drawback to doing a, um, a pre-recorded session um, is that once I have that thing that is pre-recorded, and I want to edit it, and editing usually takes three times as long to do anything in, that's pre-recorded than it is to do live. So even when I have a show and it's pre-recorded, um, I know, okay, it's an hour show. I must spend three hours in editing. And so you have to have the time to do it. Uh, just real quick to add on to that. Yeah, when you are concepting your show, uh, you have to think about how interactive that show is going to be. 
there are some shows that are uh, like I would say LA by night um, and, and other shows that are story focused and heavily story focused that you don't want chat coming in and messing with that, that, you know, they're, they're not, it's not designed necessarily and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not designed necessarily for people to come in and go like, all right, $200 I'm giving, you know, this guy Iron Man armor and away you go. Um, you know, and, and it's very, very, um, there's just a, a way of telling stories that you either want that interactivity or you don't. And we play that balancing game at Saving Throw all the time. And e every show that we do has a different way of interactivity. So, and and they, they vary wildly as to how interactive you can get, you know, uh, and we, we, we stay away from things that affect things minute to minute. And we look for more global changes to the story and stuff for people to be uh, so that the impact is a little bit broader and and helps the audience feel part of the world without affecting players uh, agency or anything like that but it's that is something you really have to think about because twitch is such an interactive platform if you want to be on twitch that's something you have to to consider okay done yeah one other thing um <laughs> blank slate would have failed if interactivity wasn't developed from the very beginning. It also would have failed of a concept if it had no interactivity. So based off of that, that's the only reason why I'm a huge endorser of it. It works for the format. Yeah, like if you have a game that's actually designed with it, it works very well. Um, otherwise it can be, well, you know, different, different votes for different folks. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to the next question. Uh, we have uh, the pop filter one. I think we've got that one about IPs. Um, and then we do have uh, one that was about uh, uh, recommended tools and equipment. Uh, that was already answered in our stream by way of content. So if you are a latecomer and you missed that bit, you should definitely check out the recording and you'll be able to find all of that wonderful info uh, from uh, Dom and Joe. Yeah. Um, let's jump to the, the, the legal question right quick. Cause I know Dom, you, you were kind of wanting to answer that. Um, I can't find it in the chat cause unfortunately my, uh, my chat <laughs> shut down for a minute. Um, but I think it had to do with, um, using, um, IP, other people's right. IP and the legal issue that may be ensuing from that. Um, if I am not a lawyer, so I will say that straight up. Um, I legally, I have to tell you, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I am a cop, though. No, I'm not. Not really. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, a cab. Anyway, um, what I will say is that um, uh, don't worry about it. Um, honestly, um, the you you would have to be. This is this is bad legal advice. A lawyer would tell you worry about it. I'm telling you, don't worry about it because you're probably not gonna be coming into this with uh, a huge amount. The, the, the worst problem you can have um, is hundreds of thousands of people coming to watch your content and having Paramount or whoever say, hey, uh, can we talk to you about this? Because you don't have anything you know, that they're gonna get. They can't sue you for anything. So all they can do is make you stop. That's, that's the worst that can happen to you. So don't worry about that. But the, what I will say is that if you wanna play the Star Trek RPG by Modiphius, go for it. You can do that. Paramount doesn't have any control over you playing their game. Uh, what they do have control is using their, uh, you know, iconography, maybe uh, using clips from the show or uh, sound effects or something that you might have to buy that are specific to that. So I know Star Trek was used as an example in the question. Uh, so that's what I'm using here. But um, those types of things, like using the theme song or something like that, those types of things are things that are actionable and, and could get a takedown notice or something. But that's honestly the worst that can happen is that you'll be presented yeah. with a takedown notice. Uh, you know, if you do a Star Wars game, use Edge of the Empire or Age of Rebellion or something, uh, Lucasfilm is not going to come to you and say, hey, don't play Star Wars, uh, because the whole reason the game exists is so people can play it. Uh, by playing it on a Twitch stream, you're not, you're not breaking any legal rules uh, for that. So, so don't be too concerned. I, I did a whole Indiana Jones um, stream using Savage Worlds. Uh, <laughs> not we 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 did we our show tempting fate did a different 
thing every week. We did Toy Story, Men in Black, Spider Man, all these things. Uh, it, it is not um, it, that stuff is is essentially in um, the IP is if we started using if we used a lot of the again the iconography and stuff if we presented it in a way that made it seem like marvel was uh sanctioning it or or sponsoring it in some way that would be an issue if you said paramount you know star trek advent you know presents or whatever you can say you're playing star trek that's not an issue but if you're saying that it's you know a star trek game i don't know there's specific language that you mm -hmm. probably want to stay away from but uh, but I wouldn't worry about it, especially at this level. Uh, and if you get to a point where that company is coming after you, fine. You know they're they're not going to sue you into oblivion and take all of your money and uh, your house and your dog and all that stuff. They there's, one there's one not caveat with that. On, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one caveat with that is that there I don't know the status on it, uh, but I know a bill has been presented. Uh, that could change, um, you know, streaming and copyright infringement into federal crimes on Twitch. Um, if that worries you, you should definitely read up on it and make sure uh, the legality there. You can get that kind of information. Do research on it. If you have any doubts, do research and then double check it or even reach out to a lawyer for some brief legal advice and things like that. There are many sources of very uh, good information out there. Uh, there's also many sources of bad information there, so vet mm -hmm. your sources and be careful. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with Kai on that. I have been on shows where they have had um, cease and desist letters um, given to them, so I would highly recommend what Kai said. Do your research, reach out to legal teams, make sure that you are doing everything above board, because there were some takedowns um, last year with, with Twitch um, and content users that they, like, without... Um, without question they just took down the videos and if you're sensitive to your content being taken down um highly suggest doing your research before um, um ensuing anything else um, um go, go ahead Joe. oh i was just gonna make a comment on uh I'm, I'm not on mute okay cool i'm just gonna make a comment on like if you have copyrighted audio like music from things if you put it on youtube it's not good it's they have algorithms that will like hear the audio and just like completely cut out your audio completely. So that is something to be aware of if you want to have like an archive on YouTube or um, on Twitch. So like they will take out the audio if they hear something that's copyrighted. Yeah, it, uh, uh, Twitch and and YouTube have have Twitch has really gotten big. Why why there were so many takedowns, uh, especially late last year, where people were using copyrighted audio and a lot of times it was audio that people had legal use to use or mm -hmm. or was were using in a context like it was in in a game, uh, for instance, um, and they could use it. But uh, the way that the Twitch algorithm worked is that is it flagged it as as um, copyrighted and it should not be on that stream. So. Twitch's response is just to remove that content. So make sure you have a recorded backup uh, just in case you need it. But yeah, YouTube will will just blank out the audio, but they do have a feature where you can choose for uh, YouTube will actually replace the background audio with different audio. Um, it will try to leave your spoken word and take out any music that it hears. It's not great. I would not rely on that to, to help you out of any situations, but uh, yeah yeah be be just be cognizant be aware if you're using something that someone else created be aware that they can come at you if you're using character art for instance uh that someone des designed and made uh somewhere else reach out to them before you put it on your stream if you can uh because um you know help them out at least give them give them a shout out uh but don't expect that that's going to absolve you from from using copyrighted content yeah so if anything Ahead, oh, sorry. Uh, if anything, uh, using um, a small, uh, like a small person's, uh, like stuff, like someone else, an artist's art is actually probably going to attract more negative uh, PR than one of the big corporations uh, hitting you with a cease and desist, uh, because you're pissing off actively some uh, fans uh, of those people. So ask, yeah, like definitely get permission, involve people, that type of stuff.
Okay. Also, um, so we yeah, are we're going over time. So um, I'd like to say something. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Ryan. So um, one of the things to consider, and you might see, this is the reason why there is an explosion of D and D everywhere on Twitch, and um, part of it is Chris Lindsay, who works with Wizards of the Coast, said one of the smartest things that Wizards of the Coast did was to have an open license for Dungeons and Dragons, which means that you can have. Uh, and use many of these systems within D and D in order to do a thing. So therefore, if you know that you get the official permission from Wizards of the Coast saying that, yeah, go and do what you need to make your D and D show. That's why it's so prevalent because they basically said you are allowed to do this. Not many companies do that. If there is a company with an open license, you specifically have to look for it. Um, but that's what allows them to do what they can do. Um, for the most part, um, if you are a content creator, unless you are very, very, very big, um, it costs corporate lawyers a lot of money to try to shut you down. But if they try to, it's because you are a legitimate threat to what is actually happening because it looks like whatever you're doing is passing off as sanctioned material as dom said so that's the area where you need to be careful again i am not a lawyer um and in the case that you are worried about it go ahead and contact uh an entertainment lawyer but you may have to find someone who is very specific to games because i have learned that in entertainment games uh, lawyers for games are actually very, very few in this country. Most people think entertainment like Disney. Look for role-playing um, tabletop RPG type lawyers, and they're very specific. Cool. I think we're going to end on that note. I'm going to just do a, a quick run around. What is your last bit of advice for someone who is just starting to um, produce their very first live stream? or content or gaming or whatever. I'm gonna start with Ryan, just a quick anecdote there. Oh, balls. Uh, <laughs> like I was not I was not planning to go first. Um, I will say that there is absolutely nothing wrong with being able to perform for an audience of two. Um, perform for that audience for two as if they were 200. Make sure that people present themselves well. Make sure that all of your cast understands that they are performers more than just players because people think oh i know all of the rules do you know what citing rules is boring if you can't actually entertain if you're on stream you are an entertain entertainer first rules person second mm -hmm. good note dom what is your your one anecdote uh keep it simple don't don't go overboard don't do too much uh from the get-go like i said start with a simple microphone a webcam and good people around you and start from there start, just make a very simple plan that you we're going to stream regularly and uh start um that nothing not, there's no harm ever in just starting something uh but but i do recommend that you start making plans if you want to grow it uh in any way but yeah keep it simple Nice. Joe, I'm going to jump to you real quick. One anecdote. Um, look out without, with the, uh, the Thank you. Uh, one more. Uh, look at what's out there. There are guides that are available on the internet. I use them. People put out their information so that it help, it can help others. So try to learn from uh, what people have put out there and just experiment with uh, with what you have and and just uh, develop on it and yeah kai oh, i i had some ideas on what i could say but there are plenty of great bits of advice already um you know i i feel like anything i could say would just be repeating another one of these wonderful pieces of advice so do you know I that just... you have voice mod on oh absolutely <laughs> great okay perfect i'm not turning it off now Okay, you go, T Pain. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, all right, well, I'm going to leave mine's less of an anecdote and more of a um, try to remember if you can, um, but try to compensate people where you can. And I don't just mean monetarily, um, you can compensate people with whatever that you are comfortable with, even if it is just kudos and graciousness. Um, just remember to compensate people because um, 
everyone's time is valuable. The number of people I've encountered that do not say thank you uh, is incredibly large. And um, it's a shame that just genuinely looking someone in the eyes and th saying thank you, I appreciate you, um, it has such an effect on people because it happens so little. Do it more often. It feels oh. so angelic coming it, from right. you right now. It's <laughs> so... I'm fine with that. It's so weird. I know you said an important point and my brain went, what is this? <sighs> this is the voice of Metatron. <laughs> but um, in terms of compensation, if it's not compensation by monetary, um, you know, tag them in things, introduce them to other networks, introduce them, you know, like uh, help them promote their projects, you know, do things that enable them to become more of a presence so that they bring that presence back to you as well and it all works in a cycle and it works as a community and on that note we're gonna do again super rapid fast what is everybody's um handles and like a one project two projects that you're working on ready set dom go for it i i'm dom Sook. you can find me at gad Sook on twitter or at saving throw show anywhere um, and, uh, I am currently working on a, uh, big marathon. We've got a bunch of shows at Saving Throw Show, but we're working on a charity marathon for the Trevor Project, uh, coming February 7th. So look for that. We've got some great guests and some prizes and lots of fun things. So yeah, come on, give us a follow. Uh, and thanks for having me. This was awesome. Yeah. Dom, thank you for coming on. You were superb. Yes. Thank uh, you, Dom. Hi. <laughs> I changed my voice again since the last one wasn't terribly acceptable. I feel like go for a more serious one. Uh, so I'm I'm Kai Norman, uh, he him, and uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram under Yokai Props. That is Y O K A I P R O P S. Uh, I'm a very serious individual, as you can tell. Uh, we have a LARP upcoming. Um, uh, we have a, a, a game on the 30th and 31st, uh, which is going to be a Dystopia Rising LARP. Um, if you would like to come check it out, we have discounted uh, new player tickets and all of that jazz. Uh, reach out early and we can help you do all of the good things and getting set up for it. Um, if you are interested in that, you can either check out our Facebook group, um, which is uh, Dystopia Rising Northern California, or you can check out our website, which is uh, www. Shit, I forgot the name. That's not great. <laughs> I'm so terrified of his voice. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the website is uh, dystopiarisingnocal.com. Uh, it's not NorCal, it's NoCal because someone stole the, uh, the other uh, host name. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm just watching chat like Chris Montgomery CM's comment of be not afraid Twitch, and I'm just cracking up right now. <sighs> oh boy, I've been having fun with this. I, I intend to use the voice mod a lot when I, uh, I do our paranoia game that we're going to test out. I, I need it. Um, that voice is mm -hmm. terrifying for me. Oh, yeah. All right, Joe! Hit, it, hit us with those handles. Hi, I'm Joe Paloma. I am on Instagram, but I'm not really... I I have a handle there. It's J-O Paloma. Um, I'm here on Life Action Roleplay. I run the, the, the technical direction, directoring, technical... I do the stuff behind the scenes here. And on another stream uh, called Nat20 Productions Official, and I help with their Pathfinder game, Edge of Legend. So check them out on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Yeah. Awesome, Ryan. All right, so I'm Ryan Omega. Um, I'm going to talk about the two shows that are coming up next week. So next Tuesday, we're going to have a game over video chat one shot called The Wonders. It's about a musical band that is going to write their one, one, one hit wonder. And so participating in this game, the promo is going to come out tomorrow, but I might as well announce who's playing. So our players for this Tuesday are um, Izzy Spring, um, Dr. Jessica Hebert, Angela Pritchett, 
Ted Minnette and Avon Gonzalez. And this is going to be a fun one shot with actual musicians. Every single one of those people is a musician. So having actual musicians playing this one hit wonder type game, I'm curious. It's, it's going to be awesome regardless. And then next Thursday is going to be the debut of Purgatory Cafe. So last week we had game design this in front of everybody. And next week we are going to play it. And you're going to see two devils, two angels. One of them is sitting right here. And we're going to have three human staff and one other guest. Two would be announced later. So that's going to be a spinoff of the Boardroom Angels game because we now need a place for angels and devils to meet. And it's this one place. And there's also humans. Great. I'm looking forward to the humans. Anywho, um, I'm Cynthia Marie. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Cindancer or uh, Instagram, Cynthia underscore underscore Marie. I'm going to go through this real quick. Um, I just got a guest spot on tomorrow for Hunter's Entertainment. I'm going to be playing Ragnarok. Woo! <laughs> so come check uh, me out. Um, I will post it all over the social medias. Um, it's tomorrow night. Uh, Saturday, I will be playing on Gehenna Gaming. Um, again, I already mentioned that, but I'll be playing uh, Vampire the Masquerade, Dark Ages. I'm very excited about it because I'm actually bringing my own personal culture. I'm going to be playing a Taino Indian um, in uh, in the Dark Ages. Um, so it's going to be specifically uh, Vikings, but I've chosen to, to play my heritage and culture. Um, and it's probably one of the first times that you'll see um, a Taino Indian being played. So I'm just, I'm really excited and, and motivated to play it. Um, I'm also a dice affiliate for Die Hard Dice. Um, so if you are looking to buy any dice or any merchandise from uh, Die Hard, uh, use promo code CYNTER, C-Y-N-T-I-N-E-R, winter, but with sin. Yeah, CYNTER. Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, it'll get you 15%, uh, I believe, off of any of your, your purchases. And the proceeds will be going to the Anxiety Depression Association of America, which is a charity I chose um, to work with. So yeah, check all that stuff out. It's on the social medias and all of my other crazy pop-up shows will be on there too. Ryan, take us out of here. All right. Thank you for stopping by. We're going to raid uh, one of our friends, I think we're going to raid um, our friends over at the Scabby Rooster. They're play testing a game. So make sure wow. you say hi as we raid them. Um, we should all come up with something to say when we raid. We always found that that was fun when we did that last time. I'm, I'm not sure. Come up with something. I'm, we'll, we're going to raid um, and Joe's going to let us know, but thank you for joining us. Thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers. Um, thank you to all of our subscribers here to this channel. Thank you for all your audience and your support. And uh, some people said, I'm not sure. Let's raid with I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Bye.